Hello there, you are watching the press preview. A first look then at what is on the front pages. Time to see what is making the headlines with the political editor of The Guardian, Pippa Krira, and the political editor of The Sun, Harry Cole. Welcome to both of you. So let's take a look at the front pages then, shall we? The Guardian leads on that statement from Vladimir Putin earlier, where he claimed that his enemies wanted Russia to choke in bloody civil strife. The head of the Wagner militia has denied trying to overthrow the Russian government. That's on the front of the Financial Times. Same story, uh, there is some safety advice for Yevgeny Prigozhin on the front page of the Star. Best stay away from open windows. In other news, a call for bank branches to retain their presence on the high street makes the top story for The Express. The Metro leading on the inquest into the death of Nicola Bully, which heard that she drowned after falling into a river. A reminder, by scanning the QR code you'll see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch us. Uh, we're joined then by Pippa Creera and Harry Cole. Um, and Pippa, we've heard, haven't we, from both Prigozhin and Putin uh, today, um, you know, possibly different stories. Um, but, uh, you know, can Putin you know, regain his hard man image, do you think, after the extraordinary events of this weekend? I think it's going to be very hard for him. I mean, what has happened in Russia, um, we're still trying to, you know, exactly what's happened, we're still trying to find out and um, isn't entirely clear, although uh, we have had a bit more information, like you say, Anna, um, in the form of an 11-minute telegram ad address from Prigozhin uh, earlier on. And then, of course, uh, Vladimir Putin's really quite angry television statement um, to the Russian people. And what seems to have happened, and it's obviously we're, you know, analysts are much more expert than Harry or I are poring over all of this, but what seems to have happened is that um, a fairly sort of, um, I wouldn't quite say standard, but a, but a, a dispute between two senior figures in, um, in the, the Russian, the Moscow regime, um, the, the defence minister and obviously the head of Wag Wagner, um, have uh, their, their, their conflict, which um, I think in, in other times might have been resolved with a judgment from Putin on which side uh, he, he, fell down, he fell on. Um, and obviously the dispute was based around uh, Wagner and Prigozhin's feeling that the defence minister and the defence ministry, Russian army, hadn't, um, it hadn't uh, prosecuted the invasion of Ukraine in the way that it should have done. Um, and uh, that didn't happen. Putin didn't come down with a judgment. And so... Uh, Wagner marched on Moscow uh, with these extraordinary uh, images and extraordinary circumstances that we saw over the weekend, which have, I think, irrevocably rocked Putin's position and, given the ongoing uncertainty, made it very difficult um, for the rest of us, let alone you know those in those in Russia, to see exactly how this is going to play out and how this power play is going to is going to culminate. Yes, and the Financial Times picking up on the Prigozhin uh, statement this evening rather than the Putin one, um, with the uh, denial that he tried to oust Putin uh, in his 11-minute voice recording. Uh, he said his goal was to protest against a recent decision to disband Wagner and to demonstrate the weakness of Russia's domestic defences. We didn't have the goal of toppling the existing regime. Uh, from Putin's point of view, though, his statement, his video statement tonight, said, I emphasised from the very beginning of the events all the necessary decisions were immediately taken to neutralise the threat that had arisen to protect the constitutional order, the life and security of our citizens, which seems so strange when uh, the Wagner group got so far, Harry. What, you know, what's your thoughts of, of what happened over the weekend and what we're to make of it? Look, firstly, I mean, as Pippa said, you know, a caveat this with, you know, most Western intelligence agencies are still grappling with what exactly happened Um at the weekend, we d we don't know. This is obviously a very fluid situation and a live moving situation still. All this talk of a deal done, um, you know, obviously Prigozhin was able to flee, but in his statement tonight, Putin appears to have revoked any suggestion that, uh, you know, he's off the hook for this. Um, it took um, Trotsky 14 years of looking over his shoulder before the ice pick finally came all the way in Mexico. Um, I don't, and Belarusia is not that far from uh, from from Moscow, so I'm not imagining the uh, former now Wagner boss is sleeping too easily at the moment. Uh, and uh, having watched that statement from Putin, that's not a man that looks like he's going to back down. 
One thing I would say is, though, do not underestimate the, the that Putin. It, it's clear that the, the that Wagner column, as it was advancing up towards the capital, was not being joined in this in in the way that it was it, it needed to be. If this was going to be a successful push, all, all this all idea that now it wasn't a, it wasn't a coup. That's not what the guy was saying at the time. He was saying, in fact, the exact opposite. He made some pretty bellicose direct threats to the regime to very senior figures in it. And it, what's clear is that. In, in, spy agencies, FSB, the GRU, whoever did not join with Wagner. In fact, the Russian military hate Wagner because they've embarrassed them along the way on many occasions over the last few years. So they were kind of caught with their trousers down halfway to the capital and decided to run away. So um, I would, um, I would, I wouldn't be sleeping too easy if, if I was uh, exiled in Belarus tonight. Well, absolutely. That's the front page of the star, isn't it? Uh, best stay away from open windows. Um, you know, there is a ruthlessness, certainly, uh, that President Putin has shown anybody who he uh, deems to have committed treason against the nation. You know, deal or no deal, uh, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, where is Prigozhin now? Is he in Minsk, as there are some uh, reports? What happens to his, you know, his Wagner foot soldiers? Will they take up the offer of merging with the, uh, with the Russian Ministry of Defence? Will they go home to their families? Will they go to Belarus? Um, you know, have they lost the, the best fighting force that Russia has so far, you know, presented itself with, Pippa? Well, Prigozhin, in his uh, remarks earlier, seemed to suggest that his troops would not sign contracts uh, with the Russian Ministry of Defence. Now, uh, as far as I can make out, he, is, he remains popular with the Wagner troops, and um, and has has a sort of a, a strong personal following. So without him on the scene or without his blessing, it's unlikely that uh, that substantial numbers of Wagner troops will will sign up to the Ministry of Defence. Not least because um, it's run by Sergei um, Shoigu, who who of course was is the individual who um, who most has has most upset um, Prigozhin and the and the Wagner group uh, for his handling of the Ukraine conflict. So um, he seemed to be suggesting Prigozhin this is that um, the Wagner troops might actually come to Belarus with him and. Putin also, similarly in his address, suggested that that might be an option for them. Um, there's some suggestion that Lukashenko, the president, Alexander Lukashenko, the president of Belarus, might um, allow the Wagner group uh, to train um, on, on their territory. That obviously then opens up the prospect of um, the conflict moving into Ukraine from the north of Ukraine, directly from Belarus, uh, which is obviously going to be something on the ground in Ukraine, which uh, Zelensky and his um, his generals will be will be watching very closely. Um, it, it is all just shrouded in a great deal of uncertainty. But you know, as as we've seen, as Harry says, anybody that that sort of challenges Putin directly, even those including Prigozhin, who were once seen as as you know a, a real sort of loyal supporter, uh, better watch out. I mean, we saw last September prominent Russian oil. Um, oligarch ending up falling out, falling out of the sixth floor of a, a, a Russian a Russian hospital, a Moscow hospital, and he was just the latest in a series of uh, senior Russian individuals who have, in some way or other, angered or stood up to the Putin regime, reaching a similar fate. So you know that's the front page of the Star. So uh, as as we've already said, I don't think Prigozhin is going to be sleeping very well in his bed tonight in Minsk or wherever else he actually is up on, you know, what, what, what Russia's enemies wanted. Uh, the organisers of the rebellion, uh, having betrayed their country, their people, betrayed those who were drawn into the crime, pushed them, pushed them to death under fire to shoot at their own. He called it fracticide that the enemies of Russia wanted uh, in Kyiv, the neo-Nazis in Kyiv and their Western patrons uh, and all sorts of national traitors. I mean, the words of Putin uh, this evening. Um, but indeed, yes, I mean, Ukraine would have you know, rubbed its hands with glee at this, at this activity. It's all these extra and incidental elements that have, have made the war so extraordinary in recent months. The Kokovka Dam, um, for one, um, the raids into Belgorod by the Free Russia troops, and now this, whatever it was, this rebellion, Harry, um, it, you know, it didn't go on long enough, really, for, for Ukraine to feel the benefit on the front line of, of, of this action. Yeah, I think one thing that was quite clear was that the troops stationed on the front were not diverted back to the motherland to try and fight this. It was, as you say, over 
too quickly. But, I mean, as a loss of face for Putin, this cannot be played down. I think the, the West has sort of agreed this joint line that it shows real cracks, but have stopped short of saying it's going to be it's going to be fatal. Um, if anything, it could actually have the opposite effect of forcing an already fairly ruthless uh, leader um, to crack down even further on, on his country. I have to say, if you're a Russian citizen who hasn't got you know, watching television over the last few months and years, it's being told everything's going brilliantly. Um, to then suddenly see your your leader on television with that blood curdling series of statements, the one on Saturday morning and the one tonight, um, you know it's very hard to contain the idea that everything's going tickety boo when you have to go on television and say actually you know blood was being spilt, six planes were being shot down, there was fratricide going on in the country. So I wonder how you know as a sort of PR uh, moment for the Putin regime whether that's going to be the real damage that people aren't necessarily going to believe a single word he's saying anymore. Mm. And uh, just as I spoke, in fact, I see a, um, a drop on the Reuters news agency, uh, Zelensky saying, we are making advances in all sectors. It is a happy day. Um, I don't know any more context than that, but, uh, uh, but we'll certainly see. Um, we know that he visited uh, the front line as well himself uh, today. So, um, you know, this, this story continues, obviously. Uh, let's move on, though, if we can, to the Stephen Lawrence case case, um, you know, uh, clearly of, of great distress once again to, to Stephen's family, Pippa, the idea that yet again justice was not served in this case. Yeah, I mean, it's very sad, this story, isn't it? I mean, I just, your heart just breaks for, um, for Neville and Doreen Lawrence, Stephen's parents, who after all these years, 30 years, are still having to go through the turmoil of feeling that justice hasn't been done for their son and that um, they can't even be at peace. Um, the, the, um, the, this was an official investigation um, uh, has concluded that Scotland Yard had information that could and should have been handed into to the inquiry into Lawrence's murder, but failed to disclose it. Um, and, you know, the Met, this, this obviously comes after the Met um, it emerged that the sixth suspect in his killing was identified. Um, and Stephen Lawrence's father and Dwayne Brooks, who had obviously was there um, uh, in that street in Elton when he was attacked and murdered, had called for the Met to reopen the investigation. So this was um, an individual called Matthew White. He, he died in 2021. Um, and the police had twice looked into him, um, but seemed to slip through their fingers. Um, and it's obviously once again raises huge questions about um, the, the original Met inquiry. Um, it uh, concerns also about what the Met told the McPherson inquiry, which was the, the inquiry that obviously took place um, in the in the uh, the years following the the Lawrence case, and concluded that the Met uh, was institutionally racist, and actually um, led to some really quite profound changes in in British policing in general, not just in the Met. Um, as a result of the McPherson report. But there's questions that even the Met maybe hadn't been completely straight with what they knew and didn't know when it came to um, dealing with McPherson. So, you know, I just I just feel really sad about it from for the family's perspective that this is this is not yet uh, been laid to rest, um, that there are obviously other individuals who were um, who were uh, involved in this, that they haven't yet been brought to justice. Um, and um, still many, many unanswered questions for the the Lawrence family and many questions that the Met itself still has to answer on this as well.